Hey everyone, how's everyone doing? How many of you are going back today home? <laughs> well, we appreciate you coming to our talk. I know it's Friday, it's afternoon, it's one of the last sessions. Uh, thank you for being here, thank you for taking the time. We're gonna be talking about how to achieve end-to-end -end QoS in Kubernetes networks. We're gonna be using the cloud gaming environment production clusters you know, where we run Kubernetes at NVIDIA as our use case to explain some of the challenges in networking and how we overcame them. I'm Surya Sitaraman, I'm an engineer working at Red Hat in the OpenShift networking team. I'm also a contributor to the SIG network upstream and also an OVN Kubernetes maintainer. Hey, all. my name is Girish. I'm a distinguished engineer at NVIDIA. I'm also one of the oven Kubernetes maintainers. So let's have some fun, right? How many of you play games? <laughs> Raise hands. Yeah. Oh, whole lot. Whole lot. So you're <laughs> the, in the right talk, in the right room. How many of you play the games that you see here? That is awesome. How many of you have GeForce accounts at NVIDIA? A few are hands, but that's uh, quite a lot, right? So we're gonna basically, so the, the fun fact, I don't play games, Girish does not play games. I've never played. But, but we're doing the networking behind all these games that you play on the cloud, right? So, so you can blame us. Yeah. <laughs> so let's imagine a scenario, you have an ongoing Dota game, right? You have some players in your cloud who are playing the game. We have a second game, which is also parallelly happening. So this is gonna be our case scenario here. We have two games, game one and game two. Let's map that to a Kubernetes cluster, which is why we're all here, right? So imagine the players one, two, and three are part of your ongoing game one, and players eight and nine are part of your ongoing game two. All of these five player pods are part of the same Kubernetes GPU node. They're all sharing the same 25 gigabyte uplink, and they're all sharing the resources on this node for bandwidth, right? And there is a Kubernetes CPU node also here, which is hosting your infrastructure components, API server and other ingress and et cetera, which I've abstracted here. So there's a CPU node and there's a reverse proxy that's running in the CPU node. And any data that is coming from the player pod to this game stream network is reverse proxy back to the internet. So external connections from pods inside the cluster to the internet is handled by the reverse proxy pod. You also have the storage node on which storage pods are running. So when you play games, you have all this data, massive data that you have to constantly feed and store and save. So that's all happening there. There are three networks, the this game stream network, which is the pink one or the red one that you see here. The blue network is your infrastructure network. So this is the Kubernetes management network, let's say. And then you have the storage network, which is the green network, like I mentioned. So the red lines you see are the game stream lines. So like I mentioned, there's two ongoing games. There's five pods. Each pod has three interfaces. The ETH0 interface is connected to the blue network, the infrastructure network. The net one interface in the pod is the game stream network. The net two interface is the storage network. So this is how we've implemented it. And the game stream infra, the storage, they're all part of the OVN Kubernetes CNI is what we run underneath it. So that's an implementation detail, but they're overlay networks, right? Uh, that's what the network here at least is, is referring to. So we have this setup and the, the red lines that you see, because the games are ongoing, you have stream traffic that is heavy. The bold lines in red signify that the streaming traffic is active right now. Let's imagine your game two finished, right? It's normal. Players eight and nine are about to log off. And before they log out, they have to save the data, their scores, their ranking, everything back into the storage network. So you can see players eight and nine have stopped streaming, no more red lines, only, only the green lines. And the green lines are actually thicker because those two pods are heavily storing back data. So all of this is egress traffic coming out of the pod using the same uplink. So when players eight and nine are contextually saving their game data, this causes a bad gaming experience for the other three players, right? This is simple, it makes sense because they're all sharing the same uplink and suddenly the streaming data gets affected because of all the storage data that's coming. And the reason why we have separate networks is the storage network has jumbo frames and you need special net, net devices to handle that. So there's a lot going there versus, and the MTU is 900 versus the stream network is 1,500 normal that you have. 
So coming to the networking requirements around this, right? So you can see a simple use case here. It's really important to ensure that the gameplay is uninterrupted. It causes a bad experience for end users otherwise. It's very, very pivotal to have a network where you have minimum latency, minimum jitter, and maximum throughput. And in order to achieve this, you need bandwidth controls, right? You need controls on each of these pods so that when your storage network is actively ongoing and as you're egressing traffic into that, doesn't affect the streaming network. So this is what Girish and I are here to talk about today. So this is gonna be the crux of our talk, where how can you tune traffic in a fine-grained manner so that you have different traffics here at play in your network and they don't affect each other. Before we go into how we solved this, I just want to level set the audience here with some terminologies which you probably have already heard of before, but still. Ingress bandwidth is traffic going into the pod. So in this case, the, we have an ETH zero. I've put a control saying it's 1.5 gigs of ingress bandwidth that this pod has. So all the traffic going into the pod at max can only have that rate, right? So we're rate limiting the rest of the traffic. Ingress bandwidth is usually applied last at the destination, just before it's entering your application or your pod in your cluster. So the traffic is coming from the source, it's traversed to the network, and it's at the sink or at the destination that this is applied. This is kind of wasteful if you think about it because it's already come all the way and this is where you're doing the rate limiting, right? At, at the pod, right before it enters. Egress bandwidth is the opposite of that. So you have a pod here I, and I have put 2.5 gigs of bandwidth control, which means all the egress traffic coming out of the pod at max can have that rate. Anything above that will be dropped. And this is applied at source. So as soon as it's coming out of the pod, you're rate limiting it at the interface of the pod. So, and for the use cases at NVIDIA here and for the scope of our talk, we are gonna stick with egress bandwidth. For ingress bandwidth, we rely on the egress bandwidth of the switch right before it comes into your pod. So we're still doing egress bandwidth even for the ingress. So for, for our talk, everything moving forward will be egress so that it keeps things simple. We also wanna talk about two other concepts, which is the, the first one being the maximum bandwidth. Everything that I spoke, now, spoke, spoke about till now is maximum bandwidth, right? So you have game seed pod one, game seed pod two, you have 2.5 gigs for pod one, 1.5 gigs for pod two, both are sharing the same ENS5 uh, uplink interface of 25 gigs. Tw to, when you say maximum bandwidth, it is literally the maximum that you can do. So even if there is more capacity in your bandwidth link, here 25, I have 25, and yet I've put 2.5, the pod cannot do anything, right? It cannot really use anything more than that. So this cannot exceed its limit, and that is the maximum bandwidth concept. Guaranteed bandwidth or minimum bandwidth is opposite of the maximum, obviously. And so if you, in this case, if you take the example of pod one, where I have 2.5 and pod two has 1.5, you have 25, so you have more capacity in our bandwidth. You can easily use more. This pod can use more because it is guaranteed to have 2.5, but it can have much more than that if your uplink has the capacity or the space to allow for that. However, if you have another application coming in that gets scheduled on this node, and now it starts consuming the resources in bandwidth, this pod will start getting throttled, but throttled only to the point of the 2.5 gigs, right? So it's always guaranteed to have that limit or that rate. So that is the basic difference between the maximum bandwidth and the guaranteed bandwidth here when we talk about the two notions. Finally, QoS. I've been saying QoS is the title of our talk, so I just wanna to quickly touch upon that. So a lot of the end user applications, not just gaming networks, you have telco, you have voice over IP, you have video streaming, you have healthcare, you have financial sector, you have stock markets. Here, latency is really important. Everywhere you need this quality of service, SLO, that you promise you'll deliver for your services. So you kind of need to see it through, and in networking, we have the quas concept at different layers. Linux does it in its own way. I mentioned we are using OVN Kubernetes, we do it in our own way, OVS, OVN, all of these layers do it in their own way. But the concept of quas is very simple. It's a network management concept that is allowing you to control and prioritize traffic in your network. You, you're able to give preferential treatment to some of the traffic. Like in our case, we want the streaming traffic to have more priority than our storage traffic. So prioritization, classification, queuing, all of these concepts are bundled together under the name QoS. So hopefully that gives a bit of a, you know, a context on all the terminologies that we're about to use for the rest of our presentation. And then finally, let's come into how all of this is done in Kubernetes ecosystem today. 
Ingress bandwidth can be achieved using the ingress bandwidth annotation that you're seeing on the pod. It's simple enough, which is just, you just put this annotation on a pod level. You say you want to give it 1.5 gigs. Underneath it, you have to either use the bandwidth plugin in CNI or have your own implementation implemented. You can put the bandwidth type plugin config in your CNI file, and that will let you set the rate, the bursts, the limits, all of that when you are um, queuing packets and doing shaping and policing for ingress. Egress is the same. You have the egress bandwidth annotation, right, where you're uh, limiting the traffic coming out of the pod. Both of these features are experimental, and the bandwidth plugin is experimental uh, in, in nature. But let's look at the limitations of these two bandwidths, which is what we have in Kubernetes to be able to do bandwidth controls, right? The API is only allowing you to specify the maximum bandwidth, not the guaranteed bandwidth. So when you're setting the annotation on the pod here, the egress bandwidth, what you basically see is that is the maximum that the pod can have, but what if you want to express the guaranteed bandwidth? Today, you don't have a way to do that. The other, th the other aspect to this is this whole bandwidth concept, the, the annotation is on a pod level. So on the pod, you can put this annotation and that is what is limiting it, but it's on a pod level. So if you have two types of traffic coming out of the pod, in this case, the orange traffic and the purple traffic, you don't have a way to say, I want control A for my orange traffic and control B for my pink traffic or the purple traffic, sorry. Right? So there's no way to do it on a per application level or on a per packet level. It's also not tunable for different applications inside the pod. So it's the same thing that I was mentioning in the previous point, but in a different way. So at layer four, at application level, at port level, you don't have a way to fine tune your bandwidth control, which is important to us. Finally, like I mentioned, we are using multiple interfaces on the pod for multi-homing use cases. You have the net one, which is the streaming network, the net two, which is your storage network. I want to be able to tell precisely what bandwidth I want for my streaming versus what bandwidth I want for my storage. So none of this is today possible using the Kubernetes bandwidth annotations. It's only on a pod level, not on a packet level, not on an interface level. We need something more fine-tuned for our use cases. We have a project called Multis, which is part of the network plumbing working group, so it's in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Multis goes one step ahead, and they have these annotations on a per network level. So instead of the per pod level, you can do a per network level bandwidth control. So in this case, you have a game stream network and you can mention for the ingress rate and the burst rate, egress rate, the burst rate for the game stream network and you can do the same for the storage network. So Multis lets you basically cover this use case, right? Where you have multiple networks and you wanna put bandwidth on that. But it still does not give you the fine tuning on a packet parameter level. So this is simply not achievable using Multis annotations today. So with that, I'll you know, let Girish take over where he's gonna show a demo of how all of this looks and how we solved it in media. Thanks, Surya. So you're all hearing GPUs for gaming and not for AI or machine learning for the very first time on the last day of the conference. So I'm really excited about that. So, <laughs> so um, let's get uh, familiarized with the demo setup, okay? So we have, NVIDIA has uh, like 50 to 60 data centers across the world where we actually let people come in, play game off of the cloud. Every gamer gets a pod, and to the pod we assign a GPU, and, and we either assign an entire GPU or a slice of a GPU based on what game they're playing. And uh, the nodes which have GPU on them, they're called GPU nodes. So we have three types of server in every data center. You have GPU nodes which have GPUs on them. You have uh, uh, storage nodes which have uh, SSDs on them, and then of course the CPU nodes run the CPU. The CPU nodes, they don't have GPU or the SSDs, the cheapest servers that you can get. And these GPU nodes, in some cases, might have uh, two GPUs or up to eight GPUs, and when you slice this GPU four-way, you can play a maximum of 32, 32 gamers. So at any given time, 32 gamers can be playing on the same node uh, alongside with others, right? All these gamers for Practical purposes, they're all their own tenant, right? So obviously we want to make sure that one gamer is not messing up with the other gamers on the same node. And on top of that, all these 32 gamers are sharing the same uplink port, which is 25 gig, and in our case, it's a Mellanox NIC, okay? And, um, and in our case, we use multi-home pods, right? Like Surya was explaining, uh, here on the GPU node, we have two gamers, right? On each of the gamer has three interfaces. Uh, ETH0, Net1, and Net2, and each interface serves different purpose. 
We kind of started this way because we didn't have a proper way to do QoS in Kubernetes. So we said, let's try to put each traffic in its own interface and thereby solving the problem. So we right now have three interfaces, one for purely streaming, which is 1,500 bytes, and one for storage, which is 900 and it's jumbo. We use Rocky V2 and we use kind of, uh, uh, gives us the best performance. We use uh, Rocky or uh, jumbo network. And the primary interface, which is ETH0, that's for command and control, like accessing API server, accessing core DNS, and whatnot. So that's your GPU node, right? The another thing to notice here is that uh, every interface to a pod is a VF, SRIU VF. So we don't use WETH, we don't use internal port, we don't use Mac VLAN, we don't use IP VLAN. So every interface to a pod is a VF. So it's a virtual, pro virtual function, it's a programmable virtual function. What that gives us is an ability to offload flows into it. So this VF, so all the network traffic going through the VF is wire speed because we offload it to the NIC. Uh, network services like firewall, DNAT, SNAT, forwarding, everything happens in hardware. So that, that gives us an ability to run things at wire speed. And we have a CPU node where we have the reverse proxy. Basically, the frames from the GPU, they get sent to the reverse proxy. And then on the reverse proxy, it gets forwarded to another interface that is connected to the internet. And then we source net the packet to the public IP, and we send that frame from the GPU that got rendered all the way to reverse proxy, then we forward source NAT to public IP and send it to the uh, client console. The client console can be a phone, it could be a laptop, it could be a very old laptop, it could be a browser, it could be anything. So that's the role of reverse proxy, basically streaming GPU frames to the client thing. And on the storage node, we have uh, uh, you know, uh, various use cases to uh, 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 to save uh, the user uh, artifact. So this is the whole setup, okay? So now we'll uh, demonstrate the uh, problems. Like I said, in this particular setup, uh, there are um, four nodes. Um, let me see, yeah. I can't seem to. It's not playing, right? Looks like things. Looks like the demo gods are not with us today. It's a recorded demo on top oh, of it. Oh, we have. I think you're <laughs> locked out. So, and that's, oh, yeah, no, that's not what I'm seeing here, though. Wow. The laptop crashed. <laughs> <laughs> You're not using GPUs? <laughs> really? <laughs> Maybe connect it back again? No, no, nothing. No, no, it's all charged, but uh, it's rebooting. We're, we're rebooting. Now. Yeah, so just think HDMI and uh, let's see. <laughs> logged in. No pressure typing password and then everybody's watching, all right? <laughs> Come on. Sorry about this, guys. Just we're rebooting here. It's funny that uh, Surya was telling, like, she has presented already three, four talks in this KubeCon, and every talk had some issue. So now she has a story to kind of... <laughs> I was hoping it was not going to be this talk, but. Okay. We're okay, back cool. On. Okay. We're back on. Hey. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. I think it's Keystone. We were using Google Slides all along and. We can put the play. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, cool. There are four 
pods here, right? Player one, victim pod, player two, attacker pod. And then we have a reverse proxy pod. Uh, and then we have a storage pod. So on the bottom left, right, we have reverse proxy pod. We're kind of quickly going to go over each pod, look at all the interfaces on it, and then kind of show you that. Uh, and then we're going to run IPER from the reverse proxy and storage, and then kind of show how attacker can victimize the actual gamer. So um, on the right now, we are looking at the reverse proxy pod, and then we started IPER there. On the storage pod, we'll show you the links. There are two links there, and each of them is a VF, like SRO VF backed by Melanox. Uh, interface, and then we have a route. Uh, the route output shows that there are two routes there, and we're running IPerf. So now what we are going to do is uh, we're going to kind of uh, show you what's the, the interfaces on the victim pod. Uh, there are three interfaces, like I said, one for streaming, one for storage with the Jumbo MTU. You can see the 9000 MTU there, and they're all backed by SRO VVF. And uh, on the other attacker pod, it's the same uh, set of interfaces. Um, so we're going to now start. Uh, the IPerf client uh, trying to connect to the, uh, the the respect to storage server. And you can see that now the streaming is happening, let's assume, right? It's a 25 gig uplink. Since no one else is using the uplink right now, the entire good chunk of 25 gig is being used by the streamer. Streamer is happy. But now the attacker came in and started a storage traffic, which is Jumbo MTU, by the way. It kind of consumed the entire, like almost a whole lot of uh, bandwidth from the uplink, right? And then if you see on the left, the bandwidth throughput dropped from 22 gig to 3 gig, right? And uh, this kind of clearly shows that uh, an attacker can come in and influence or uh, do, do bad things to the, um, 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 to the victim. So here, um, we're just showing what I just demoed. Basically, the attacker can come in and then send a storage traffic out and then kind of victimize the uh, streaming out there. So how did we solve this problem, right? Again, there are no APIs. There were no APIs. So what we did was we resorted to DSCP. DSCP is a very well-known uh, field in IP header. It's called Differentiated Services Code Point. It's a six-bit field. Since it's six-bit, uh, you have uh, up to 64 values. Now, using this field, it's end-to-end, -end, right? Because it's an IP header, it's end-to-end. -end. Every element in the network can see it. And using the 64-bit field, you can kind of differentiate how to, you know, each network traffic. So. Um, what we decided was to use uh, like a DSCP value of 32 that kind of co corresponds to 0x80 as a way for telling it's streaming, and then we assign 70% of the upstream bandwidth. And then um, for storage, we use 0x8. It's just a numbering. It could be used. You can one can use anything. The, the trick here is to decide for a given uplink what percentage of uh, network traffic has to be assigned to your application. So then we went, uh, this particular demo quickly shows uh, uh, what we did here, right? On every node, on a given interface, here it's ENP197, SZF0, you have to set up the node in a way that, hey, uplink, you have 25 gig. And out of this 25 gig, you could have at least 64 applications, because there are 64 DSCP values. And then we take those DSCP values and then match it to a traffic class. And on that traffic class, we actually set uh, the bandwidth, right? In our case, for streaming, it's 70. And then for storage, it's 20. And then we are kind of mapping here, saying the DSCP32 to priority 1, and DSCP34 for priority 3. And the DSCP32 value is for streaming, and 34 was for storage. And then this priority is being matched, like I said, to traffic class. And then we set a right bandwidth, right? With that, I'm going to uh, see if I can fast forward a little bit, or we have time. So yeah. Now, with all those things configured on the GPU node where the games are running and the IPUF are already running, we're going to start the storage with the DSP marking of 0x88, right? Since it's a minimum bandwidth, since no one else is using the link, you are allowed to oversubscribe because it's minimum guarantee, right? The moment I start streaming with the right x80 value, the hardware underneath immediately sees that there is a new network traffic that's marked differently, and I have to honor it with 70% of the bandwidth. And immediately, you can see that the storage traffic from 24 gig went all the way up to 6 or 5 gig. And uh, the streaming always started off with the right bandwidth. It never ever saw. So this is how we solved it. But there were some gotchas with it. Um, what was the gotchas? Right? We went to literally our application developers saying that, hey, when you guys compile your code, 
open a, open in on your socket where you send this UDP packet or uh, streaming or storage packet, just set the DHCP value to these numbers. So we're going to application developers and then telling them to use these DHCP values. So obviously, that's not, you know, because we are all one org, we trust each other and everything works. But if you have a tenant, like you are a gamer, like the gamer can escape out of the game, he's now on the pod, and now he can start running hyper for whatever it is with the whatever other value and then start messing around. So obviously there was a trust boundary issues, and then with the absence of API and no RBAC, this was um, not going to work out. So the solution that we decided was to kind of come up with a, a new uh, custom resource called network cost. Okay, the spec for network cost is as shown here, right? Like, like how Surya was telling, um, any you have a pod, pod has inbound traffic and outbound traffic, right? Ingress or egress. For a given direction, you can either say maximum bandwidth or minimum bandwidth, right? Maximum bandwidth is you can go all. The, maximum bandwidth is you have a cap rate. Minimum is you're guaranteed that minimum. If no one else is using your link, you can still go. So in this spec, what we're doing is we are kind of focusing only on the egress direction because that, that's what actually was very useful to us to begin with. And then we are uh, doing both minimum and maximum for a given direction. So in the spec, the first thing we have is a pod selector, right? We have to select the pod on which we want to apply the cost rules. And now our pods are all multi-home, right? We have to select on which interface on that pod we want the cost rules to be applied. That's the network attachment name. And then within that particular network, we want to make sure it's a fine-grained L4 traffic policy, right? We want only certain UDP traffic, like data paths to be uh, uh, treated differently compared to control path. So that's the classifier aspect to it. And the bandwidth here is for the maximum bandwidth, which basically uh, caps the bandwidth, and then there's a, uh, it's doing traffic policing. Anything exceeding that maximum bandwidth, the packet gets dropped. Finally, we have the DSCP, which is actually to mark the packet. And based on that marked packet is what uh, um, we kind of uh, uh, treat the minimum bandwidth, right? At 0x80 and 0x88. So, so with that API defined, let's quickly look at. Uh, so yeah, so. This is the demo which will take uh, you know which will take you all through how we are using this network cost API to kind of make sure the victim pods are not victimized. So the name is called Fix Victim. So we're going to fix the victim pod here on the Oven Stream network, right? Because streaming is very important. So on that network, we are saying uh, we're going to uh, fix this issue, and we are basically matching all the pods of type victim, and then we are saying uh, uh, anything to uh, TCP traffic uh, 5201 mark the DCP uh, value of uh, 80, right? So with this particular, uh, 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 we have not applied it yet. Let's start the storage here, right? We're starting the storage traffic. It's consuming the bandwidth of uh, the entire uplink. And then we started the stream. Uh, and obviously, it's not 70% of the uplink. Now at the bottom, we actually applied the policy. And then I can see that from 3 gig, it went up to 21 gig, right? And then I'm going to delete the policy at the bottom here. So at the bottom, right, if I, when I delete the policy, uh, you will see that uh, the streaming traffic will uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, go back to 3 gigs. So because I deleted the traffic, it kind of went back to the uh, 3 gig instead of the 70% of the uplink. So uh, this basically kind of visualizes whatever we did. One thing I would like to mention here is that See, from within the pod, nobody's marking any packet. So we don't trust the tenants, so we don't let them mark. So the packet arrives unmarked into the OVN SDN control plane that we have. And the OVN SDN control plane is configured with our CNI to tell any packet matching this particular traffic flow, mark it with certain value, either 0x80 or 0x88. So it's completely, the marking is completely done outside of the pod, on the control plane, on the host. And once we mark it, the hardware comes in and then looks at the packet and then kind of uh, uh, does the job of providing the minimum bandwidth. So that's what it says. And again, uh, uh, it's the CNI that implements this is Avant Kubernetes CNI. It's a layered uh, architecture. Uh, we have OVS at the very bottom, uh, open virtual switch at the very bottom running on every node. And this OVS works uh, with the constructs called as open flow rules. 
And then on top of OVS is OVN, that is a distributed SDN control plane. And, and the OVN itself is configured by Avan Kubernetes CNI. So this whole uh, stack is the, our CNI, and that CNI implements this uh, COSP API. And one thing we would like to share is we're very happy to announce this, that um, we became a sandbox project uh, just a week ago. So we're very excited about it, and Surya is going to lead us through the whole uh, transition. Yeah, so like Grish mentioned, one of the main reasons why we, why we became Sandbox is to come and collaborate more with the CNCF community. So this network quas API is a CRD, is, is Kubernetes type of API, right? Like we want to see if this is useful for end users. We are looking for feedback. And we're trying to see if it makes any sense to come and try to design this upstream. Like there's our design and POC, please do check it out and leave feedback. If somebody's interested in trying to uh, implement this for other CNIs, that's also pretty good because we want to collaborate with other C CNI plugins and try to bring this API back to maybe SIG network. We don't know exactly where, but we, wa we don't want to do anything that is CNI specific, but yeah. we would rather do something that is reusable by everybody in the community. So we are sure to bring this back to the community. So definitely talk to me and Girish uh, and give us feedback on if this makes sense and what is possible here. I know we also have some DRA efforts in trying to see how pods can be scheduled on a specific node where the bandwidth is available. So I know there's a lot of exciting work going on with DRA and networking in general. But maybe we can express more things like policing, shaping, rating, bursts, all of this on the CRD. So definitely let us know uh, what your thoughts are. And with that, we come to the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for Yeah, thank you so much. And we made it on time with all the reboots. Yeah. We're also open to questions. So any questions, please do use the microphones or you know. Hello? Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so this overall this looks good and, and useful. Um, I was just thinking out loud as, as you're going through it, how what you're doing there sort of looks like what what else you can do in, in, in pod, say, for re requests and you know limits for memory and CPU? Would it be possible in the future to add network as a, you know, on, on specifically in the pod level like that? Yeah, like in CPU, like resource requests and limits. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's the APIs in core are a little bit hard to change, but then I think what you're asking, your question, if I understand correctly, is can we bring the notion of network to the API and then put limits there? Or did I get that correct? No, no, he's asking uh, within the pod spec where resource request limits are there, we've asked for memory and CPU, can we also ask for network bandwidth and uh, priorities? Yes. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, uh, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a lot of changes to the to core, the core report, pod yeah. spec. Yeah, obviously this is not anytime soon, but just. Yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. a great idea, and I think it's something we can consider as an alternative to the design instead of going with a completely new CRD. So that definitely. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so thank you for uh, your excellent presentation. So I have a question about, uh, you, uh, in my understanding is correct, you said uh, you are using a uh, Rocky V2 in storage network. So is it possible to use with uh, this uh, network QoS API with uh, Rocky V2 network? Yeah, yeah. so uh, Rocky V2, uh, it is definitely possible. Um, we are already using it. Um, the Thing is, Rocky V2 is not very um, amenable for natting and QoS and everything, right? If you do it, it will all be done in software. But uh, we worked with the vendor to make sure that uh, you can apply uh, QoS policies on Rocky V2, which is all UDP based, and still achieve the line speed. Yes, it's possible. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. I was just curious how much the move to OVN Kubernetes and using OVS for your flows impacted what you were experiencing in terms of line rate for your SROV implementation with the Mellanox devices. Oh, like we, we, we were able to demonstrate the line speed. All the demo I did was on, uh, on Mellanox NIC25, Mellanox CX6DX, mm -hmm. and uh, with all, everything being offloaded, that's why we could literally see the line speed. So there was not much effect is what uh, I would like to say, yeah. Awesome, that's excellent cool. to hear, thank you. Okay, thanks. Cool. Thank you everyone for yeah, coming. Thank you everyone. Have a thank great you so much. Evening.